Sam Cedar on the Majority Report on the phone. Pleasure to welcome back to the program the Washington Bureau Chief of the, um, I mean, I think people have heard of this, uh, the Huffington Post, uh, Ryan Grimm. Ryan, Happy New Year. So, okay, so, Ryan, now I know that you spent uh, your entire um, uh, holiday vacation uh, probably in Congress hanging out with uh, Luke Russert playing uh, flipping <laughs> cards in the press room at Capitol Hill. It would probably sounded uh, it was probably really romantic in uh, that playing old quarters. Way. You know, yeah, you, you much of a quarters fan? Oh yeah, sure. I was. Uh, I you know, listen. I, I went to college. Now, of course, oh, back, there you go. back when I went to college, we didn't play with quarters. We played with actual gold bullion. <laughs> you know what that would be worth nowadays? Oh God, I know. We really blew it. We spent it all on beer. Um, all right, so let's go through this deal. Um, before we sort of analyze it, let's just walk through essentially what it was. Now, what, what's really sort of fascinating to me is that when the deal started, it was sort of because it was passed in the Senate before January 1st, I think, or maybe it passed actually on January 1st at 2 in the morning. I don't know. You tell me. Um, it was a, a raise in taxes, and then the next day it became a tax cut, right? Well, the irony is that when it was struck, you know, when the hands were shaken, then at that point it was a tax hike. But, it, but you're right. It didn't actually go onto the Senate floor until... The first, so at that point, it became a tax cut, and uh, Jason Lincoln's made a a really hilarious point this morning. Is that uh, so? Grover Norquist, you know, told his people, then senators, "Hey, you vote like this is a tax cut. Uh, you're safe. You know, I'm not gonna uh, ding you for being a tax raiser because you voted for this. That I, I I consider this vote to be a vote for tax cuts. Okay, super." What did the people who voted against it do then? Right, they voted right. against the tax cuts. I mean, you can't you can't both vote for tax cuts. You know, one you know, if a yes vote is a vote for tax cuts, then a no vote by definition has to be a vote for tax hikes. So most of the Republican conference, all of the Tea Partiers basically voted for a tax hike according to Grover Norquist and Marco Rubio uh, and Rand Paul voted for a tax hike according to According to Grover Norquist, so whatever you know, it just shows us but, the kind of but, Alice in Wonderland thing that this is driven into. But but after we go through this, I want to get back to that point because to me, that is really crucial in understanding where the leverage uh, lay with this and why, mm -hmm. in my estimation, this was a missed opportunity. That exact dynamic uh, is really uh, is really, I think, the point. And and I quite frankly think the reason why it happened at the last minute and. And maybe not necessarily by design, but it, it certainly was sort of the path of least resistance, was that it creates ambiguity around that vote. So that mm -hmm. um, down the road, everybody can sort of go to their constituents and say it was something that they want it to be. But let's, let's walk through, before we get to that part of the analysis, let's walk through what it is. We have taxes now have been raised on... Any amount of families of four hundred and fifty thousand dollars, or I should say, every dollar earned by a family above four hundred and fifty thousand dollars, individuals four hundred thousand mm -hmm. dollars, it has gone to the Clinton era tax rates, right? That's right. And then walk us through on capital gains and dividends because this is where I think um, there was uh, those of us who feel that. Um, Income uh, should be treated as income as opposed to uh, special income if you're, if you're a rich person. Yeah, and this was probably one of the bigger missed opportunities. that uh, So dividends uh, on New Year's Eve snapped back from 20% uh, or maybe it was 15 15%. or whatever they, they were. They were snapped back to 39.6%, which is what they were under uh, the Clinton era rates because they were taxed as, as at the same rate as income. The, what what uh, Democrats gave Republicans here is now it's now it's at 20 percent, uh, but only 20 percent um, above the 400 and 450 threshold that, that that you mentioned. So that's 
that's basically cutting dividend taxes in half. And I don't know what your dividend income is, but I, I don't have much dividend income. And most of the people I know don't have much dividend income because we're not rich. Right. And, and this, is, this is a huge tax cut for people like Mitt Romney. Who, now, we should make you know, it clear, who, too, there's a distinction between capital gains and dividends. Uh, capital gains and dividends are not necessary, or in the past, anyways, weren't treated the same. Under Clinton, like you right. say, dividends were 39.6% um, uh, and uh, well, for people who were making over, um, I think the threshold at that time was probably around 250. Uh, but uh, capital gains, I think, were at 20%. And so now dividends are... Uh, we're cut back. I mean, again, it's confusing because over the course of 24 hours, the rate shifted three times or two right. times, I guess. Uh, but it basically, yes, it basically says if you invest in a stock, somehow the income that you make from those dividends uh, is so special and so valuable to society that we're right. going to tax it at a, a lower rate. Now, of course, that's a joke. It's just because rich people have um, uh, sort of bigger hands on the more important levers, and they wanted to make that money. Right, and, and what dividends are, just very straightforwardly, is an, is an extraction of wealth from a company. You know, the, the, the common understanding of, of the stock market is that it's a way that companies uh, raise capital, and then they go out and then they invest in their companies, and they, um, you know, they create jobs, and they you know, make profits, and then the share price rises, and you know, everybody wins. Uh, but, but in fact, that's not, that's not the purpose of the stock market. The purpose of the stock market is actually to distribute wealth to shareholders. Uh, whether and you know, we can get get away from the the term purpose, even if we want to, uh, it's it's the function. Right. The function of the stock stock market is to dole out money to 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 owners, and that comes at the expense of uh, consumers and and workers. So, uh, the, you know, so when when it doles out this money, let's say Bain Capital, um, you know, buys a company, uh, you know, re- forces it to take a. a on a ton of debt, and then it uses that debt uh, to pay out dividends to its new owners, Bain Capital. It is extracting wealth from the company, and that wealth that they've extracted is, is now going to be taxed at 20% instead of what it would have been, 30, 39.6%. And it, and it also uh, you know, creates more incentives for, for these private equity and hedge, fund, uh, hedge funds to basically just set up their operations so that they can maximize rich people's uh, tax benefits. You know, a lot of these private equity firms aren't even in the business of searching out the best uh, investment, you know, trying to find the best guy making the best mousetrap. They're, they're actually just pouring through the tax code, trying to figure out uh, ways, that, ways that they can just game the, game the tax code. If it weren't for that, I don't, I don't know what Bain Capital would do. Right. And, and, and of course, it's, you know, it's, it starves us from revenues on, 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 on the, on the, uh, on the actual just pure tax rate side. It also, this is money that could be going to workers and to wages that would help the economy mm-hmm. in a way that, of course, you know, uh, Mitt Romney, he can only buy one loaf of bread at a time or even just, you know, one loaf of bread per house or whatever it is. And, right. um, uh, but the fact of the matter is if this money was ended up in the, uh, the pockets of, of wage earners, this money would get back into the economy more. So, uh, contrary to the notion that somehow, these, uh, you know, dividends encourages investment that will uh, create new jobs or, you know, shower benefits on the job uh, creators and they'll go out and do their, uh, you know, their, their godly function of creating jobs. No, it, 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 it in fact does the opposite. It, it stifles right. and demand. The, and the more you incentivize uh, dividends as, as a form of income, you know, by reducing taxes on them, then the more you encourage companies uh, to give more and more dividends uh, to their executives, and the more dividends they give to their executives, the more inequality we have, and the less the less capital that the that the company has, uh, but the more capital that these executives have. Right, and this is this is exactly what what we have seen since the '80s is when a compensation packages for executives, for board of directors, and whatnot were tied into the stock um, to the stock prices. It also created misaligned incentives, and this continues that um, uh, that. Um, uh, that problem in that it creates a misaligned incentive for what is good for the long-term health of the corporation or the company, and in, I'm 
including in that is also the benefits that might accrue to a community because you have a company that's working there that's uh, mm-hmm. paying decent wages, and the people who run that company who see more benefit in uh, basically the cottage industry that is their side bet on uh, what the company is doing that is driven less by the long-term plans of the company and more about uh, cutting wages, outsourcing, uh, maximizing short-term profits uh, so that you can put the cash in the coffers of these companies and they can pay it back to the shareholders. Right. Just ask any town that has had one of their major companies taken over by Bain Capital or another private equity firm. Uh, you know, the, the private equity firm walks away with a ton of dividends and the, the company is left with, with a ton of debt. You know, the mob calls it a bust out. It's a it's an old school organized crime strategy, uh, and, and you know the you know there isn't a, a ton of difference except for the sophisticated terminology and that the you know the, the the violence used is you know the you know private security guards and and uh, local cops rather than you know Tony Soprano bashing somebody's head in. Yeah, that reminds me of Dick Army, but I guess we'll get to that story later. <laughs> but um, uh, the um, so and so, let's move from that. And if people are wondering, like, you know, why did the Democrats cave on that? Um, you know, I think people have to perceive cave is just such an interesting way in which we use it. It, it, it gives the benefit of the doubt to the um, to the KV or to the caver mm-hmm. in a way that uh, mm-hmm. I don't necessarily uh, buy into. But in another area where they supposedly caved was the estate tax, which um, has gone up from where, again, from where it was a week ago, uh, but not nearly uh, to where it was 10 years ago. Uh, tell us uh, what what the terms are on that estate tax. Uh, well, actually, I'm not exactly sure about that. What did it, I, I'm, I'm guessing that it came to... Um, My understanding I mean, I, is that it's 40%. I, I forgot about it. I, I, I reported it, so I should know. Something like, what, 40% for... Three million. Uh, Four, actually, level? it turned out to be forty percent with a threshold of a five million dollar exemption. So, in other words, a single individual can give five million dollars away upon their death, their estate will, um, and then every dollar <laughs> for people making over four hundred and fifty for every dollar over four hundred and fifty thousand uh, dollars, and this is where it gets complicated because that becomes uh, income. One would presumably, if you get $5 million, then your income would be over that, but I guess that's tied into your income, is 40%. That's the only one question I Mm -hmm. had about that, how that came out. It becomes 40%. Under Clinton, the exemption was at a $1 million, and then every dollar after that, 55%. And remember, if your husband or wife dies, then you get the full $10 uh, $10 million that two people would be allowed to bequeath. Uh, and then presumably right. over that, everything, if those people were making, and this is where it gets complicated for me, if they're making over $450,000 a year, then they get uh, a 40% tax. I've got to look into that. But the amazing thing about this is we are talking about literally less than 5,000 families this is going to right. impact in the country, in the country. Right. If we were at the Clinton levels, it would be closer to 40 million people who would right. be subject to this. It's stunning. Right. And, and so this, I, I, this came down to uh, the, the rates, rates versus uh, the estate tax. And, and Democrats were very public about their, their willingness to trade the estate tax to get the, the rate down. You know, McConnell was demanding a $750,000 uh, threshold for on income. Uh, rather than uh, what they ended up at, you know, the four and the four fifty. So, you know, some Democrats thought thought that they, you know, had extracted some concessions out of Republicans by giving away the estate tax to get it down from, you know, seven fifty to four hundred. Uh, of course, if nothing had happened, you know, it went up on everybody, um, and you know, people thought that they could get. Uh, 250 fairly easily, but here's where here's where it comes back to your original point that it gives too much benefit of the doubt to the to the to the caver. Uh, I don't think that it was a real cave. Um, I don't think that most. I don't know about most, but uh, but enough Democrats uh, to to be decisive didn't actually want the threshold set at 250 for for rates uh, on income. They were much more comfortable with four or 450, 
and we could get into all kinds of reasons why that is. But I think I think part of it is is social that that this is the world that they that they live in, you know, where people a lot of their friends that's what they make. They make, you know, they make more than two fifty, but they make you know close to half a million or a million a year, and so. The, you know, and then they still, you know, carp about the the price of private school. So, you know, to them, uh, you know, these people making three or four hundred thousand dollars a year are not quote unquote rich. Um, and, I, and that's one I think problem that you have with that inequality creates because you have these people living in in worlds that are just completely different uh, from the people that they're supposed to be supposed to be representing. Um, so, yeah. So I think that they were happy to kind of get thrown into that briar patch of, yes. of 400 or 450. Yeah, I mean, we know, we heard Schumer and uh, Pelosi at one point this year come out with, uh, we should make this at a, at a million dollars. Uh, yeah, and, and it was... Yeah, it pull, mm-hmm, that's and, right. And, you know, and even Israel, like Israel had a great interview on MSNBC where they, he's a DCCC chair, they asked him, um, are you willing to go to, uh, um, you know, 400, 450? And he said, no, I was, you know, I'm 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 very willing to go there because you know it's a it's a concession we're making to Republicans um, and actually frankly I think it should be at 400 450 because uh, you know because the the arguments that I just raised raised that you know you're not rich at 250 in some urban areas yada 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 uh, and so you know in the same breath he pretended it was a concession and then and then then conceded himself that he wanted it right. uh, which means it's not a concession and and Republicans knew. Um, that they could yank it out of Democrats easily. Lindsey Graham even said on uh, on one of the Sunday shows he was on with Diane Feinstein. He said, you know, he was asked if he would do 250. He said, no. Why would I do 250 when I know Diane will do 400 or 450? And he's dead right. Of course, that's that's how you negotiate. If if you know that they're going to give it to you, then of course you're not going to give them more. Right. And, and this is, you know, this is this is the story I think that is being underreported, is that this is not about Democrats and Republicans. This is really just about rich people, uh, you know, getting yeah. into a, a comfort zone with what they what they want in terms of taxes. Uh, and uh, this is, you know, I, I think I think it's it's one of the problems with inequality is that, of course, it perpetuates itself. Uh, because right. your lawmakers mm-hmm. um, become completely oblivious to what the numbers mean. Like, you know, if you're living at 250 in New York City, my gosh, it's almost impossible to send your uh, two kids to a uh, $40,000 a year private school. And <laughs> That's right. Well, yeah, I guess it is. Uh, you can't own your own <laughs> jet either. So, uh, <clears throat> boo-hoo. Um, yeah. But, but it, it's... Uh, it, it's and of course, the other aspect of that is not only does it affect um, the uh, it, it has a uh, an impact on the political on uh, on the political sort of uh, economy has an effect on the real economy too because then all of a sudden the idea of paying for more expensive things drives up the prices for everybody else and puts a lot of things mm-hmm. out of people's reach. Um, and we we should say that in terms of these estate taxes, it is about a three hundred and seventy five billion dollar giveaway over the next decade, which people should keep in mind, the chain CPI, which would take uh, anywhere from, depending on how old you are and how many years you're on Social Security, take anywhere from uh, 3 to 10% away of your meager Social Security um, uh, earnings, it is double the amount of savings that we would have gotten mm-hmm. from the chain CPI. And I say that because that's probably still on the table because we got more of this yep. uh, BS to go. But uh, the sequester has been delayed for two months um, under this deal, which basically just means we've punted to where the Republicans have um, more perceived leverage just because we've allowed them to have a perceived leverage, right, with the debt ceiling. Right. And th- and. This will this will be fascinating. Uh, you know, Obama has for a couple years now, since you know, since middle 2011, vowed that he was not going to negotiate on the debt ceiling again, and and said that you know this is one of the things that he wants to leave as his legacy. That that he is not. He feels like if he negotiates on the debt ceiling, that it changes the nature of the presidency, in the sense that the Congress becomes that so much more powerful in the sense that it can. It can hijack the agenda whenever it wants by threatening to default, and he is uh, passionate about defending the principle that uh, that Congress can't do that, and that the 
power needs to be balanced out between the White House and, and Congress. Um, he's been saying that privately, we know from you know Woodward's book and other reporting, for a long, long time, and in you know, the last few months, he's been saying it very publicly and very firmly, and he repeated it last night. And I'd, I'd like to you know, leave him an opening to, to stick to that. He sh- I think he should. Uh, it's, you, know, you can't run a, you know, an empire like this. You can't run a global economy pretending like you're going to uh, default at any moment. Um, and you know, he, he could just say, look, the Constitution gives me the authority to, uh, uh, to pay the debts. Uh, I'm going to hold an auction. Arrest me. You know, what are you going to do? And uh, we've got some. Uh, but we're but didn't on a story he already take that, that off the table? I mean, didn't he already tell? Didn't uh, Carney already say we're not going to we're not going to use any type of constitutional? Uh, we, you know, Carney Carney said that at a press conference, um, but Obama has never said it. And I, oh, during 2011, Obama did get briefed by Cass Sunstein um, about it. He had Cass Sunstein look into it. Uh, Geithner didn't like it because it you know, creates uncertainty around the auction and, you know, and at the time Obama really just wanted a grand bargain. Uh, so he didn't, he didn't actually have an incentive to go along with the, the 14th Amendment argument. Um, but, but Sunstein didn't say that it was, and this is in Woodward's book too, he, he didn't tell Obama that you couldn't do it. He said that it wasn't advisable because there was some murkiness around, you know, the title, would the, would the bonds be legit that that were auctioned off? Um, and so it's not an ideal solution, and so they they didn't go forward with it. Um, but it was not ruled out. Uh, you know, Carney has poo-pooed it for sure. Uh, but what else is there? I mean, if you're not going to negotiate, uh, and the House is not going to pass it, then you know, I. I well, the other thing is you option? cave. I mean, that's the thing is that like I don't know what is. And the interesting he, thing is, I mean, is, he is. I, I mean, I really do believe that he. That you know, you know, there aren't many things that I, that he really, I think, feels that passionately about. But the power of the presidency and his legacy uh, is definitely one of them. And you know, t- this to me seems like something that he is is willing to lay down for. This, uh, uh, and except and for he didn't. People, but it's the problem is, himself, you know he what said, I mean? But the problem is, he set the marker already for himself. And, and this is putting aside the notion that, um, that you know, I mean, I guess, you know, my sense about the, the, the what must happen in 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 the, inside a, a presidential administration is that they have these different sort of buckets where they think these buckets, we've got to fill up a certain amount of these buckets to create a legacy. You know, we've got the singular uh, legislation, the Affordable Care Act. We've taken care of that bucket. Uh, mm-hmm. And maybe this is his, um, you know, process bucket. Uh, this is the one where I'm going to leave the presidency in, you know, uh, better shape than I found it as an institution, which I may or may not agree with, you know, whether or not the presidency should have certain powers or not. But that's that's what they have in there. And, you know... Uh, it's it's sort of sad that that's you know I, he's really passionate about that part of the legacy. It's interesting to me because it seems to me that most of the reporting or the analysis from the left has basically said he was also just as adamant about the 250 threshold and the idea that they were going to kick that the, that they they punted on that to 400 thousand has signaled to the Republicans uh, that this guy there is no line in the sand for this guy. And that, that's why well, he's going to fail. On, with it the... depends on what he's defending. You know, if he's defending uh, entitlement programs, then maybe there isn't a line in the sand. If he's defending tax rates, uh, you know, there, there might not be a line. But if he's defending um, his own legacy and the legacy of, and, and, you know, the, and the institutional power of the White House, then, you know, all bets are off. Maybe there is a line uh, wow. that he's willing to, to stand on. Well, I can't. I can't wait for the American people to rally around that uh, that part of the process thing. They put everyone well, to sleep. I mean, think about it this way: Would so let, let's House Republicans respond by saying we're going to like launch an impeachment, you know, hearing over this because you're paying the debts. You know, I can't imagine a, a less popular thing for them to try. Oh, I agree. You for paying our bills. I agree. I mean, uh, like, although I dare you, kind of thing. Although, although the 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 Republican uh, Congress doesn't, 
I don't think for the most part they don't operate on that perspective because uh, the Republican Congress is just interested in what their their narrow constituency uh, wants. And I think there's going to be a lot of uh, – I think that – I, I, I would argue that for something around 75 percent of those members of Congress, and it's probably the ones who voted against this deal, uh, they probably think in their mind, um, I would get points for trying to impeach the president over this. I mean, I, I, frankly, I'm surprised they haven't tried it with Benghazi or, uh, yeah, you know, I, or I Bo's video that. for Christmas, whatever it is. I think yeah, the White House might welcome that. Right. Well, I mean, that'll be interesting. All right, so let's keep going through this. The alternative minimum tax is permanently patched. That's not. That's more or less a wash. That's been happening, uh, it seems to me, um, every year. So there's really no uh, change there. And that thing was designed sort of poorly not to index, is my understanding. But uh, the payroll tax holiday is going to expire. Uh, it's not really, in my estimation, uh, a tax hike because this was sunset in the same way that the – the, the Bush tax cuts expiring was not a tax hike. It's, it's reverting back to where it legislatively and statutorily was supposed to be. Um, the, right. There are okay. limits on de- deductions and exemptions. What can you tell me about PEP and PEAS? I, uh, I have not been making that much money uh, as of late. Uh, and so I haven't, uh, I'm not, I'm not t- too familiar with the personal exemption phase, uh, phase out or the, uh, P's deduction limitation. Do you know anything about those? I mean, I, I the broad, in broad strokes, it just means that, uh, deductions are less valuable, uh, you know, above that threshold. Uh, and so, um, it means that a rich person's tax bill is slightly higher. Oh. Uh, Ari, Fle- Ari Fleischer, uh, yesterday on Twitter said that, you know, if if he gets uh, if his deductions are 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 worth a little bit less next year, he's he's very likely going to reduce his charitable giving, uh, which is you know such a such a heart of gold. Oh, I know <laughs> it's so <laughs> hard. Guy. It's so hard on the guy. Uh, I mean, because he's going in almost every day and having to put on <laughs> you know like a little bit of makeup and get in there <laughs> and 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 talk. It's hard to get off that you know it's a it's real pain. Ah. Uh, and just the idea that you know somebody who's making uh, I guess four hundred and fifty grand is going to have to pay another six grand uh, a year in uh, ta- it's just it, it breaks my heart and uh, yeah. particularly around this time these of are the, year these are the prices we pay though uh, the only upside in in this uh, the biggest upside I should say um, and frankly I think it's the only upside I, I don't I don't see uh, well there's two. You've got uh, tax rates for low-income Americans, the earned income tax credit, the child tax credit, the American opportunity tax credit are extended for five years. You also have a one-year extension of unemployment insurance. So it's going to help out people who desperately need this help. It's the only thing that wouldn't have happened on its own as of January 1st. Um, So it's the only real, it seems to me, get uh, in terms of stimulating the economy uh, and um, that would otherwise required leverage, right? I mean, because let's get back to this whole point. If the clock had struck midnight and Joe Biden and Mitch McConnell hadn't gotten together, you know, and I don't know, drank a bottle of doers or whatever it is that they do and uh, made this deal because they trusted each other because they were, you know, both white and old or something. I don't know what it is. And uh, they hadn't made this deal. Then today, tax rates would have gone up on any, on everybody. It wouldn't have made a difference because we're not going to pay that tax until uh, 2013 in, uh, 2014 in April. So there's plenty of time. Today, somebody could have introduced a bill, uh, whether it came from, I guess, the Senate or the House, and said, we're going to cut taxes on 98% of the American public. And in addition, we're going to put in un- uh, unemployment insurance. We're going to put in these tax credits. We're also going to put in the debt, some debt stealing legislation, whatever it is. We're going to put it in there. We're going to send it to the House. They're going to amend it, right, to take those things out. It's going to go into conference. The whole thing's going to fail, and everybody's going to blame each other for, a tax, for, for, for killing a tax cut. But everybody's going to be inclined to believe that it's the Republicans. Why wouldn't that have been a better situation? Well, I mean, I think you're arguing what a lot of Senate Democrats, including Reid, argued at the time. 
um, and are still arguing. Uh, you know, if it, only it, one it, of them could have hold, held up something. If only there was something like a uh, filibuster. <laughs> yeah. I mean, uh, you know, it's the you know internal party dynamics. Um, you know, leave the uh, leave leave the power. You know, in right. you know, in these major parties with the White House when they control it. Um, but sure, I mean, he, he you know, Reid could have. Um, you know, he's still the majority leader. Um, but you know, it played out as it did. But yeah, you're, give me you're, the you're counterfactual. Not alone in, in give me your, give me the counterfactual because I know, like you know, Politico has a big piece on what happens, and they quote they they have. Let me quote from their piece: The president did not believe the dynamic would suddenly shift in his favor after January one. In other words, my scenario, the president didn't buy into. He rejected the conventional wisdom in Washington, which I guess is, I had that conventional wisdom, that all uh-huh. sides would have more flexibility after higher tax rates took effect. Republicans were more likely to compromise after the deadline than before it. The White House concluded. Um, I, I don't think that's exactly right. I don't think that's what we're no more likely to compromise. Okay, so give me the counterfactual. Make the I mean, argument. I think that, what he was actually thinking that he didn't want to go over the cliff. Um, uh, that that I think is the conventional wisdom that he rejected. Not that he wouldn't be in a better position after. Uh, you know, bargaining position after January 1st, but that he thought the the economy couldn't suffer like a week of going over the cliff and getting, you know, the markets getting rattled and uh, all, you know, all other hell that he thought might break loose, breaking loose. But in um, real terms, what would have happened? I mean, you had a piece uh, a couple of weeks ago saying that in terms of government agencies were concerned, they were basically going uh, going forward, assuming that the sequestration was going to get resolved in one form or another. That's still hanging over our heads, right? I mean, that's just two months away. Um, but, I mean, what would have been the impact today in terms of what, you know, dollars in people's pockets that were not feeling aside, I guess, from the unemployment insurance, uh, and not those uh, tax credits, because those wouldn't be applied for another 14 months or whatever it is. So what would have been the real difference? Yeah. You know, I, I actually think the the business tax extenders, you know, a couple hundred billion of which were stuffed into this, were probably played a big role in this. You know, the, the, you know, the wind sector would have lost all its tax credits, uh, Etc. You know things like that. Um, Obama might have been worried about, but in general, I agree with you that that um, that the you know the agencies themselves and the Pentagon and the IRS weren't planning any changes in January, um, and we're going to wait until things played out. So, so I think he did have a week or two, but uh, I think that's what he. I think that's where he and the and the conventional wisdom kind of split, and so he was pushing much harder for a, a, a fast deal. Let me ask you this question. This is maybe a little bit cynical on my part, uh, so forgive me. And, you know, my resolution is going to be starting tomorrow to be less cynical in 2013. Uh, I promise. Let's, but, hey, let's do it. Um, but to what extent? I mean, look, there was, there is, you know, so much of this, uh, of what the president thinks, is driven by, we know, sort of the, the, the village thinking, let's say, okay? Uh, the Washington um, uh policy elite, if you will, uh, the big money that plays there, obviously the finance uh, sector. Um, but so much of that is reflected back by a lot of, um, of the, the media. And uh, particularly like the, the wonkish media, there was a lot of desire to sort of uh, say that the fiscal cliff was a complete, um, you know, cataclysm, that to cross over it was a cataclysm. Mm-hmm. And there was almost a feeling like, boy, we really got to, um, the worst thing that could actually happen is if the fiscal cliff comes and there isn't something cataclysmic that happens, we're all going to look like we don't know what we're talking about. And it almost seems to me that on some level, this narrative was built up. And then, uh, and then people realize like, oh boy, this is going to cost us big in terms of just sort of like the perception of our, um, of what we're, uh, if we know what we're talking about, if we don't make it like we're, we're desperate to avoid this thing. I think that, I think that's right, and I and I think and maybe hopefully they'll be a little more cautious in the future about making stuff up um, that that has no basis in reality. I, I don't, think it's, you know, maybe they got a scare out of it. Hope and will correct themselves a little bit in the future. I, I'm not real confident of that, but I think you're right. That that was a real risk 
to kind of the elite consensus. Well, there. then I'm changing my resolution. I'm going to stay just as cynical because apparently that's the, <laughs> that's the only way to be with that. Well, all right. And so, and then the big issue, of course, now is we have the debt ceiling that's going to hit sometime in the next two months, right? Or it's already hit, but all of the the means in which um, uh, Treasury avoids the uh, basically that they're having to hold another auction to fund the money that's already been spent by our Congress uh, is going to come. And that's going to be the real, that's the real scary thing in terms of those of us who are worried that things like Social Security and Medicare are going to be on the table, correct? That's right. They will be. You think, well, I mean, they're, I mean, I guess they're already on the table. Right. The question is, they are. who's going to have um, the, uh, the, who, who's going, who's going to be knocking it off the table? I mean, Based upon what we've seen here, who's going to, are people saving their powder? Are they keeping it dry? I mean, is there a reason why, you know, um, were there people, do you have a sense that there were like members of the Progressive Caucus who were like, okay, Social Security, Medicare not included in this, uh, in this mini um, uh, deal here, uh, this punting deal, uh, fine, I will vote for it, I will support it. Because, you know, it seems to me that, the Democrats provided all these votes for it in the House. They extracted no political price from the Republicans. It basically allowed the Republicans to vote as they wanted on this, um, which lets them off the hook. There's no way Republicans lost in this deal, in my estimation, because what did they give up? They didn't even pay a political price for this. So, I mean, what do... Yeah. I mean, is that right? Am I right about that? Because, I, you know, I keep seeing like people saying, this is Republicans are paying a price. Well, but how? Who? What political price do Republicans pay? The the price is that they is what that they have to give well, the unemployment ar- insurance. I mean, the argument the argument would be that uh, they have since like the early '80s had a you know we will never raise tax rates um, pledge and a commitment and philosophy and that and that that was broken and that that's a big deal and that with that broken, uh, you know they, they you know their edifice crumbles, you know, something, something along those lines. And, you know, they, I, they certainly did not want to break on that. Um, but Ryan, but Ryan, tell me this. Okay. Give me your sense. Who, like, who, who is that? Who's that, that, that charge is hanging around the neck of a pretend Republican party. In other words, there's nobody going out there and saying, you know, okay, the majority of Republicans in the Senate, but for those uh, hundred some odd Republican congressmen, uh, the vast majority of uh, Republicans in the House, they didn't go back on that pledge. They still go back. They don't pay a, mm-hmm. a, a, a political price for that. They go back to their constituents and they say, I voted against it. Um, there's yeah. no, you know, like who, who, uh, Grover Norquist is not holding it against them. There's no primaries that anybody's going to have to worry about. You know, to the extent that they they are paying the price because they broke that, that's completely ephemeral. There's nobody who's actually paying a real price for breaking that tradition of not voting for us. Uh, uh, I mean, that's all sort of it seems to me made up. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> right. I mean, but you know, they made it up and then they stuck to it for a while. So, it, you know, and and you know, um, I think the next uh, argument should be about. Uh, more more brackets um you know why is the highest bracket at 450 or whatever it is why right. not have one at a million another at two another at three another at four and, I, and you know i'd you like to see that for the estate tax too. raise the rates on those on those brackets as yep, well i think so and uh hopefully we'll we'll see that in the future i mean uh you know these I think guys it's possible if they try to come out with some cuts that democrats will come back with some tax reform approaches and that's the most progressive tax reform that you could think of. Yes, I agree. And also on the estate tax. Now, we're not going to see it because, um, you know, they're they're owned by the wealthy, too. But that's the best weapon for Democrats to come yeah. back at, right, is to say, OK, you want to renegotiate this? Let's do it. Let's uh, raise some of those tax rates on the on the wealthiest of the, of the wealthy. Yep. Well, uh, I guess we'll we'll have to talk in the, in the weeks uh, before that debt ceiling uh, fight to see if uh, you're hearing any any ideas of that ilk. Sad but true. This goes on. Yes. Well, uh, Ryan, thanks so much for catching us up on. It. I appreciate it. <laughs>